Hi, everyone. We're glad you're joining us on this third day of the annual Atlantic Festival. I'm Susan Solney, contributor to Atlantic Live, and we're here to talk about K through 12 education. Schools across the country are in month one of our new normal as a result of COVID-19. Remote education, full or part-time, is posing new challenges for students, parents, and teachers. What lessons have we learned so far? Will the pandemic be an opportunity to make lasting systemic changes to our education system to better serve every student? We have so much to talk about. But before we get started, I want to thank Nestle Waters North America for its support of the Atlantic Festival. And we want to invite all of you watching to be part of the conversation by submitting your questions via the chat function. Now I'd like to introduce our first session here to discuss the burden on teachers across America is Randy Weingarten, president of the American Federation of Teachers. Randy, welcome. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for having us. Let's start with a big quick question on everyone's mind. Is it safe to reopen schools in the United States? Are there adequate resources in terms of funding, space, and frankly, trust to open safely? So let's start at the, at the end. First off, Susan, thank you for having us and thank you for doing this panel. Number one, let's start with the value proposition, which is, Remote education is a very poor substitute. It isn't a substitute. And most of us, if it is safe, want to bat, be back in school. And frankly, we did this report back in April, and the report was about not whether to get back in school, but how to get back into in-person learning. So the question is, it depends on where you are. In a place that is really, really, that still has very high COVID rates, and we're watching them go up again, but if it's over 5% positivity rates, then the WHO, the CDC, other, and most of the research says it's not safe because schools, particularly indoor, will become super spreading events. But in lots and lots of other places where you actually can have what I call the big six, which are still in the CDC guidelines, mass and, um, and physical distancing of six feet, cleaning and ventilation, reasonable accommodation and washing your hands. If you have those things resourced, and if they are really done, not in, you know, pretend that they're done, but really done, then it is safe to actually start school knowing full well that there may be outbreaks and it may mean that things have to close and then reopen. So that that's part of the reason why you saw in New York City just this week, the special needs programs opened, but there was a lot of sturm and drum beforehand because our union felt it was not safe. And we will do everything in our power, both to make it safe and to assure parents and educators what it takes to make that safe. So your last question about trust is really important. It has to be, what does the science say? What is resourced? And do parents and teachers trust it, particularly in light of the fact that, and I know we don't want to get political here, but frankly, the, the administration has done a terrible job in terms of their chaotic, inconsistent, and confusing advice and guidance, which makes people from the beginning really skeptical and which has made this political instead of about a public health pandemic. Right. Just yesterday, Miami-Dade, <laughs> the nation's fourth largest district, announced that it will be returning to classrooms next month. It, uh, it would be the biggest district to have schools in classrooms full time. And this comes after the AFT successfully sued the state. Um, can you walk us through what's happened to yes. get us to this point in Florida? Well, what's happening in Florida is that, that the big districts, and Hillsborough wanted to do this as well, the big districts in Florida basically said, because of the surge, seeing 25% 20, positivity rates, that you could not open during that period of time. The, the governor and the um, secretary of education basically said, if you don't um, open, fully during that period of time, we're gonna take your funding away. And that's part of the reason why Hillsborough kind of flipped. But what essentially happened during, also during that period of time, and you saw it in New York City too, 
is that parents basically made the decision that they weren't going to send their kids to in-school learning. A few people said they would, but in Dade, in Broward, in, in, in Hillsborough and other places, because of the surge, they were like, no, this is unsafe. So parents and teachers were on the same side, basically, but the governor and the, um, and the secretary of education basically were backstopping Trump and pretending that there was not a problem. And that's why we went to court, and that's why the court, and but we basically said to the court, Florida has a long history of letting districts make their own decisions here. Let them continue to do that. And the court sided with us because of the safety issues. But, you know, Florida being what Florida is, the, instead of listening to the court, the governor just did his own thing. So in the places that had the highest positivity rates, everything has been remote for the last several weeks, meaning for basically the last, the last eight weeks. Miami and Broward, who are the last of the biggest districts that are closed, have said, no, 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 no. We're gonna, when we reopen, we're gonna do it slowly and gradually, just like New York City is trying to do, just like Boston is trying to do. So what we're seeing around the country is that we started school with 70 of the 100 largest districts going remote because people thought it wasn't safe. We are slowly seeing districts um, in these big, big, big um, area, in these urban areas say, if we can make it safe and if we can resource it, we're gonna gradually reopen. That's what Broward is, you gradually reopen in-person learning. That's what Broward's doing, right. that's what Dade is doing, that's what New York City is doing. So that document you held up earlier, that's the AFT's flexible blueprint, as you call it. Yes. And if I understand you correctly, what you're saying is that some essential criteria needs to be met, but this is not a one-size-fits-all uh, situation Correct. for the entire country. The most important thing I can say, and frankly, look, I'm not a scientist. I'm a social studies teacher and a lawyer. But before we did this, we spent hours and hours and hours with experts. And frankly, that's what most of us used to rely on the CDC to do. The CDC used to be God. The CDC never was political. That's part of the reason it's so alarming that you could have these amazing experts on TV saying one thing and the CDC saying anything else. But what we did, and that's why I want to say what we did in April. I live in New York City. So April was still a huge um, area, it was still, it was still, you know, you know, the, the ground zero of COVID in New York City. But we kept saying, we don't want to reopen the way in which we closed. So there were five things. You need to actually have COVID positivity rates either going down or plateauing very, very low, less than 5% and less than 1% spread per day. Number two, you need to have a tra testing, tracing, and isolation process in order to make sure that an outbreak doesn't become a surge. That was Florida and Texas's failures this past summer. Number three, you have to have what I just talked about, about the big six, so that you make sure in a, a situation of COVID where 40% of the spread is asymptomatic, you got to make sure that it can't spread indoors. And that's why you have to have the mask, the physical distancing, and the other things I said. Number four, what right. you said, Susan, is trust is so important because people don't trust anybody right now. And number five, you've got to have the resources. So that's what we've tried to do. We represent 3,500 places across the country. What we've tried to do is not start with a political close or not close or you hate or like Donald Trump. We've tried to start with, here's the science, and this is what you need to reopen. And then... Why do we do this? Because we know in-school learning is so much more important than remote. We know that 16 million kids don't have computers still. We know that there's real issues in terms of social isolation. We know that there's huge stress and strain. And, we, and so we wanted to make sure that you don't pit living versus learning, but safety has to come first. And let me say one last thing, and I'm sorry that I'm talking so fast and, and doing this, but <laughs> Our members, we, we've done two polls in the last three months, both of them. One was, if we could get the safety guidance in, in, in June, we said to our members, if we could get the safety guidance, where are you in terms of going back to school? 75% said, if you can get these guardrails in place, we want to be in school with our kids. That includes 
hybrid education because you have to reduce capacity. Unfortunately, we don't have the space, double the space or double the number of teachers because of budget issues. But just in September, we did a poll with, with NAACP and LULAC and Arrows, three parent groups. We asked parents and teachers. 79% of teachers said, if we could get these safety guardrails into place, they want to be back in buildings with kids. And 71% of parents said that. So our exercise is to try to do that, but that means we need the resources and we need people to trust that it works. But in order to trust, it's trust and verify, and they have to see the safety guardrails there. COVID-19 has exposed a great many things about our education system. What to you are the most troubling things? You've the mentioned inequity. hunger. Mm -hmm. It's the inequity. It's that, I mean, uh, let's take this. beautiful private schools that have lots and lots of space. They could put a tent up this fall, this spring, or they could, or let's say this fall, this summer. Parents could have afforded pods. They could have had reinforcements. They could be just fine. What about all those districts where we serve poor kids? Take any of the cities that have um, that, that have connectivity, the, 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 the internet companies, they should have been giving internet for free to everyone who's a parent that has a kid in school, private, right. I, public, parochial. The, I've heard you the, say the, that access is a must uh, have. It, it's not it's a, a luxury. It's a must have. So, and the, the issues about uh, mental health and wraparound services, so, so what we are seeing in terms of COVID is COVID has disproportionately affected indigenous populations, black and brown communities by the number of people who have been essential workers in those communities, the number of people who have been sick in those communities, the number of people who have pre-existing conditions in those communities, the number of people who have been unemployed in those communities, and then being in school districts that actually have less funding and as a result, less access to curriculum, less access to remote, less access to well-being resources, and less access to food. So it's the inequity that has, has hugely hit us in the face. But the one silver lining I would say, and there's no silver lining where you have a disease where 6.9 million people have been infected, infected and 200,000, 201,000 dead, is that you could see from the beginning of this the gratitude that people have for teachers and for having public education and for ultimately bringing kids back into a community and bringing kids back into community and into schools. And so I think that if we can get through the learning loss and get the resources right now to do whatever band-aids we can, there's going to be a renaissance of public education because of needs of creating and recreating that community of learning. A renaissance, that would be incredible. Um, you mentioned this uh, briefly. When the pandemic first caused schools to close, teachers were seeing all kinds of praise acknowledging their hard work. But now we're seeing uh, more criticism as many teachers have been vocal about their fears of risking their lives to return to the classrooms. How do you respond to that difference in tone and a little bit of the backlash that we're seeing? Well, I frankly, and I'm, look, that's part of the reason why I put this paper up. I frankly blame Donald Trump and Betsy DeVos for that, because what they have done by politicizing this, by at the beginning of July saying reopen schools as if that teachers and kids, particularly in high-risk areas, were, were are dispensable, it was unconscionable. We know that people are, are in horrible agony all over the country. This is part of the reason we're trying to reopen schools. But they should have done their utmost to get those resources from for, for the Heroes Bill. I'm sorry that I'm, like, spitting bullets, but we've been at this since April. And Betsy DeVos has not put one bit of guidance out there in terms of helping people. The only guidance she put out there was, by the way, there's still going to be standardized tests this year. It's outrageous. And what they did, like what they do all the time, is they try to pit people against each other. They try to create that kind of polarization. But that's part of the reason we did a poll with our 
you know, with our, our, our parent um, groups, our parent allies, because what we saw is that parents and teachers are basically in the same place. We need it to be safe. We need to make sure that we have the safety guardrails and people want to people want to go back to school if we have that. And and so let's get to actually doing the real work instead of um, blaming people. Normally, and I think this is what people hope and expect, teachers always figure everything out. That's why they were lauded as heroes, which is what they normally do to try to figure out once we had to go remote. Most of us have not taught remotely either ever or very rarely. But we had to figure it out, and we did figure it out. And, and people were lauded for this. But in the middle of a pandemic, you can't figure all of this out. You need some resources. And hospitals, and look, I represent 200,000 nurses who are in hospitals every single day. And we actually had to source PPE from China. I've never bought anything like that from China to get people the, the protections that they needed. But ultimately, you look at the protocols that hospitals were going through in the height of COVID. Everyone expected everybody to wear a mask. They didn't let um, patients' families in. There were these protocols that were absolutely sacrosanct. And the fact that, 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 that Donald Trump and Betsy DeVos and all of them feel like teachers, meatpacking workers are dispensable in towards a higher, towards, towards whatever they think they need to be doing, that's what we're angry about. I know people are fearful, but we have to overcome their fear parents and teachers, and that's what we're trying to do. Let's talk a little bit about what will happen inside the classrooms. You've shared that you think remote learning cannot be a substitute for in-person learning. How can teachers make remote learning more engaging and efficient for everyone involved right now? Great, great question. So um, there's, there's, we just did actually a seminar on this two Saturdays ago, which was oversubscribed because there are some kind of tricks of the trade that are really different in terms of remote education than in in-person education. So number one, you have to be real. Well, number one, you actually have to have equipment. So you can't do remote education on a smartphone. I'm doing this interview with you on an iPad. You need to have an iPad. You need to have a, you know, keys that you can type in. You need to have a computer. You need to, kids need to have like real equipment that they can use and then where they, a screen where they're not squinting and they can see. And then you need to have connectivity in a home, not just a hotspot, because you need to have enough that you can see video. Video takes a lot of connectivity. So number one, the hardware is really important. Number two, you gotta be intentional about actually seeing kids and hearing their voices and their voices really mattering. So it's not just about who the attendance is and taking attendance and figuring out which kids are on or which kids are not. You really have to kneel into and into well-being. And, and sometimes you gotta start the class every single day with kind of round robin, how are you? What's going on? Talking to kids by their names, making sure that they're on the screen, making sure their camera is on. All of that stuff is really important because you're not in person and you can't read any body language. So that gets to number three, which is you can't do as much on the screen in any day as you can do in person because you got to actually make sure that, 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 you're, that the knowledge is one thing and the reinforcement is another. And so for younger kids, you can do a lot of the you have to do a lot of direct instruction on the screen and then group work reinforcing later on in terms of a different, um, not, not in the same, not in the same, you know, 30 minutes or so. You got to do that differently. For older kids, you could do it asymptometrically. I think I said that word right. You don't have to do direct instruction all the time into the screen. You can have a kid then say, okay, I'm going to watch the lecture at 10 o'clock at night but then make sure that there's group work on the screen. So there's, there are things that we have learned over the last few months that will make remote better. The thing we do know though, is that the kind of for-profit entities that have sold remote education for years and years and years, they've been pretty terrible. And in fact, Miami-Dade just kicked out K-12 Inc. And, and, and lost the $15 million contract that they spent on K-12 Inc because 
it wasn't working. And so what's happening is that there's not a lot of good platforms or a lot of good remote curriculum, even though these remote companies have been around forever and have actually been you know, standing up virtual charter schools. But now you can see from everybody using it that it's not been what people really need. Um, say there's no vaccine by the end of the year and more districts open without meeting the criteria in your flexible blueprint. Would you advise your members to strike? If there is not, uh, if, 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 if a district is not safe and it is putting kids and teachers in harm's way, yes, I would, because safety comes first. And because you can't replace a life Ultimately, learning is really important, and that's why we have been supporting. You noticed that in July, we said, you know, so in April, we put this out. In July, we said three weeks after Trump did his thing and really created a lot of confusion and a lot of chaos and a lot of agita. We said, if things are not safe, we would support safety strikes. You notice how few there were. And that's because people, even all throughout the country, they at least got even though it's political in some places, unfortunately, they at least got the mass and the physical distancing right. And there's lots and lots of kids that are on remote right now instead of in school. But those two things are really vital. If that's not there, and we don't have enough good ventilation systems, and we see that there's this kind of spiking, yes, then we're gonna say to people, don't go, don't be in schools because it's our obligation. It should be the government's obligation, but we see it as our obligation to keep people safe, to do whatever we can reasonably do to keep people safe. We know that nothing is risk-free and that there's, 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 no, there's nothing in a pandemic where you can be the guarantor, but we have to do everything we can to keep people safe. Well, Randy, uh, I think that's a wrap, but I do want to share the results of our poll question of our audience. We asked, which age group is more important to return to in-person learning? And 75% are saying elementary, followed by right. middle and high school. Um, well, well, thank you so much, Randy. I would, I would agree with that. <laughs> that's a wrap. Randy Weingarten, thank you for being with us today. Thank you. For our next conversation, we'll discuss how the fall semester is unfolding in New York State schools with Dr. Betty Rosa, Interim Commissioner of Education and President of the University of the State of New York, and Rima Amin, a reporter with our partner, Chalkbeat. But first, a message from our underwriter, Nestle Waters, North America. I grew up in poverty and meals weren't always easy to come by. As kids start the new school year, millions will be struggling to get the food they need to learn. If your family is in need, Nestle Pure Life and No Kid Hungry are here to help. Everyone, please stand by. We're having some technical issues, but we will return with our programming in just a moment.
Hi, everyone. There's been a slight rearrangement of our schedule, but for our next conversation of the day, we'll focus on the future of America's K-12 education system. I'm joined by Richard Barth, Chief Executive Officer of the KIPP Foundation, and Sal Khan, founder of the Khan Academy. Thank you both for joining us. But before Thanks we... For Yes, before we dive into the future of education, let's take a moment to talk about what's happening right now. Sal, I want to start with you. You've promoted the benefits of online learning for years, but I'm sure this scenario isn't quite what you imagined. How has the pandemic affected demand for your online resources? And you offer them now with what new or different advice? Yeah, and to be clear, you know, I am something of a poster child for online learning, but I'll be the first to say that distance learning and online learning are not necessarily the same thing. So what we're dealing with is very suboptimal. I'll also be the first to say that if I had to pick between an amazing teacher and amazing technology, I would pick the amazing teacher every time. Uh, ideally, we can have amazing technology in service uh, to what an amazing teacher is trying to accomplish with their students. In terms of what we've seen, uh, you can imagine, you know, when we when the school closures, actually when they started happening in Asia in February, we started seeing our traffic pick up there. And then in March, when it started to become clear that it was going to happen in the U.S. and much of the rest of the world, it was one of those moments where you kind of, you look left and you look right and you say, I think this is us, uh, because uh, people were going to need something that is free, that's accessible, both at home and kind of a consumer lens, but also for teachers and have teacher tools that's aligned to standards, that covers multiple subjects and grades, that's trusted, et cetera. And so that first week, we saw our traffic in a normal time period. We have about 30 million learning minutes per day. We saw that go up to about 80, 85 million learning minutes. We saw parent registrations would be about 20 times normal. Uh, just over the last few months, we got about 20 million registrations. Uh, we have a total of about 110 million. Uh, teacher and student registrations were about 10x as no of normal. And so we were just trying to keep up with that, trying to keep up with the demand, and then put out webinars for teachers and parents on how to support distance learning. Uh, we put out lesson plans. But it became clear that uh, the closures were going to happen over the summer. We, we've been trying to do efforts to just keep people engaged. And now that back to school uh, continues to be distanced or, or hybrid learning, we've been doing things like get ready for grade level courses that ensure kids have a strong foundation and can fill in all their prerequisites uh, before moving on to their, their grade level work. Uh, Richard, how are things going uh, with KIPP? Uh, beyond academics, I understand you found new ways to support families that are making the transition from in-person learning to remote learning. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, sure. I mean, it's it's been a stretch, and I'll I'll start with you know repeating something Sal said. I mean, this has been a um, human uh, you know challenge and, and really catastrophe on so many levels for the country, for the world, and certainly for our families. We've done everything we can um, to mitigate. We have 255 schools, over 100,000 students. Um, last spring, when uh, the pandemic arrived here. Uh, we became one of the biggest food service providers uh, in public school history, um, coming running out of our schools. Uh, we raised money to make sure we have 15,000 alumni on college campuses. We had to make sure for campuses that closed down, our alums could get home, get home safely, um, and then actually had the tools and technology um, to keep learning uh, during the pandemic. So that's how we, we had pivoted unbelievably quickly in the spring to meet the most base needs of our families and of our students. And then for, for relaunch this year, uh, where we had more time, um, I think there have been three keys to, to, to a relaunch that's been, by and large, virtual. Um, only a couple of uh, places across the country have relaunched in person. And um, the three big things we focused on were, one is immense, intense, constant contact with families. Um, the family partnership um, has never been more important, and um, we've learned a lot doing that. But our families have been alongside us each step of the way as we went into relaunch. Second thing was making sure we had the tech capabilities, and we learned a lot, um, not always the best way, but but we learned a lot um, about where our families and students were in terms of tech um, capabilities and what we needed to provide. And then the third was just uh, doubling down an intense amount of teacher professional development. We're, I think, 100% better at um, distance learning today than we were in March. It's not what we want to be. We want to get back to in-person learning. Um, but those have been the three keys, family partnership, investing in tech capabilities, and then lots and lots of teacher professional development. Great. I want to ask both of you, I'll start with Sal. What has the country's COVID response exposed that's most troubling to you about our education system? Sal. Well, the most obvious one 
Well, the most obvious one is really on the digital divide side. I think the country's actually done a reasonably good job over the last 10 years uh, closing, not fully closing, but doing, making progress on the digital divide in schools with things like the E-rate program. But uh, COVID has put a big spotlight on the fact that 20, 30 percent of kids don't have suitable Internet access at home. Uh, and that even when we in a lot of places have been heroic efforts to get laptops out, to get Internet connectivity. But even then, there's five or 10 percent of kids that are just not engaging in some way, shape or form. They don't have the supports at home. Maybe multiple people have to support have to use a device. So that's been the most obvious uh, gap that COVID has put a spotlight on. And then, you know, everything that I think we would have talked about pre-COVID around inequities uh, have just been more obvious. Uh, the schools with the more resources, some of the smaller school districts out in the suburbs, they've been able to move faster because they don't have to provide as many of those social services. They had more devices out there. They could rely more on uh, at-home connectivity. Uh, so uh, that is, you know, my, my hope is that the silver lining is people are finally seeing it because of the spotlight. And so things like the digital divide post-COVID uh, there's going to be a lot more energy to close it and a lot more energy around things like personalization and the idea that learning shouldn't be bound by time or space. Because even pre-COVID, one of the major gaps we've been seeing is that kids show up all over the place. They have different levels of preparedness. They need to learn at their learning edge, but it was very hard to do in a, in a traditional academic model. I think that's going to become even more of an important issue as, as we go through COVID and beyond. Speaking of the divide, Richard, I, I read about one of your districts in North Carolina where teachers had to literally deliver packets over um, uh, hundreds of miles in a, in a school bus to, to kids who had no chance of getting Wi-Fi. Can you tell us more about that? Yeah, I mean, I think, and this Saul just said this, I mean, I think we discovered when it comes to the digital divide that um, a couple things, 20% of our families did not have good uh, access uh, just from a Wi-Fi standpoint. And particularly, that was uh, hitting us in rural communities in North, eastern North Carolina and in the Arkansas Delta. Um, even where the service uh, might be free, um, the the reach wasn't there for our families. So we this spring had um, our buses running our traditional pickup routes for all our kids, and we were using those pickup routes to drop off homework packages, and then in the morning come back, collect the homework, and do this every day. And so. That was our temporary solution, not not the one you'd want to be in permanently, but that was our temporary solution. And it showed, I mean, our teachers have just risen to this moment um, in a way that's just beyond imagination. And our families have too. And, um, you know, I'd say on the, the digital divide, just to amplify something Saul said that I think has been underestimated, there's the issue of does every child in the house have a modern working device? There's the issue of do we have the uh, Wi-Fi access? And then there's a third issue, which is just comfort and, and confidence with using the tool. Um, yeah. We have, we, we've hit a 1.25 to one um, device to family ratio, device to student ratio. So we've got more than 100% coverage. We've covered Wi-Fi. When we relaunched this um, fall, uh, our schools were looking at um, uh, help desk tickets in day one and day two of four and 500 uh, uh, contacts long. So. We were working through those help desk tickets, and thanks to, again, principals, assistant principals, school operation leaders, we were able to answer all these needs in the course of the first three to four days. But just for the public to understand, it's about access, it's about um, having a device, and it's also about uh, know-how and comfort with using it. It can all be accomplished, but um, it's work. Let's talk about two areas that we don't usually think can be replicated well in a remote setting. That's STEM and the performing arts. How are KIPP and Khan Academy dealing with STEM and the arts? Richard, uh, why don't you start? So um, on STEM, you know, we've made um, a big investment over the last couple of years uh, in working with a program called Amplify Science, um, done immense amounts of training um, uh, for all of our teachers. And um, for that, what we were able to do and are doing right now is converting it um, into um, the ability to be distributed uh, virtually. And I feel good about um, what our teachers have been able to, to, to do on that front. And most importantly, I feel good about what we know provide them to keep um, STEM learning going. I'd say on the performing arts, um, it's, it's a, uh, in the arts, it's going to be a bigger stretch. I'd say the, the most important thing we've been able to do there is um, our co-curricular teachers uh, absent our sports teams, um, have been able um, to, um, it, we've given them the full opportunity to create the, the kind of opportunities for our kids to do the work on their own. And it's a big, you know, learning for all of us. Um, when we put aside 
are you know five year olds and our six year olds, and that is a that is a, a different um, situation. Our older students. Um, ability to use a whole chunk of their day to actually do work, including artwork, um, uh, I think it's exceeded everyone's expectations. And it, it is, when you think about the future of what we do, it is teaching us some things around um, how we could do things differently when our, when our kids come back. Their ability to work even uh, more independently um, and show us what they can do, I think we're learning that they're able to show us what they can do in ways we haven't been optimized for in the traditional um, setting. So our arts, is, we're playing catch up. Science, I feel I feel better about. And obviously, we can't do all the experiments we want to do. But um, I think our teachers feel really well equipped. Uh, Sal, any feedback from the people who are using uh, the academy on that? Yeah, on you know, uh, Khan Academy. We, we've always we've tried. Where our goal over time as a not for profit is to cover all major subjects. But we've started with math and with STEM, so that's where we've been strongest. But even there, even pre-COVID, our view has always been there's certain things that you can learn well and practice well in a modality of, of Khan Academy. You know, your traditional math problems, you can get video instruction, you get as much practice and feedback as you need, your physics, your chemistry type um, exercises. Uh, but then there's another aspect where you want the in-person, where you want to be able to do a lab, you want to have a discussion about it, you want to tackle a more difficult thing. And even pre-COVID, our view is use Khan Academy for some of that more traditional practice and instruction. That way, when people get into a room together, I guess now it would be, you know, get into a Zoom or Google Meet together. Uh, that's where they can do some of these higher order tasks of simulations, games, a lab work. Now, in the COVID world where it's distance learning, a lab is not quite the same. We've seen schools do, you know, kitchen chemistry type things, et things, et cetera, et cetera. But another thing that we've been emphasizing is, you know, this is not the year that we're going to be able to do everything, uh, we being the whole system. And so to try to focus on some of the core skills and make sure those don't atrophy, and it, they are the traditional skills. They're the math, they're the reading, and the writing. And if we as a system can ensure those don't atrophy over this very tough period, then I think kids are going to be all right in the long run. Right. It's about changing priorities. Um, but along those lines, how can remote education upgrade its social-emotional component as we know how important social-emotional development is for children and we're in the middle of a pandemic and a racial reckoning and these times can be very traumatic for children? So, um, Richard, do you have any ideas on that? So, you know, I want to uh, just just emphasize, I mean, there are limits to what we can do really well um, uh, through virtual learning, right? There are limits. Sal's just described them. And, uh, I think we're seeing our schools do some things that I do think um, are, are mitigating, not solving, but mitigating the challenges. One is for our younger kids, like we, and for all our schools, like starting with morning meeting. You can do morning meetings um, and make sure you're touching base with every child. Um, and understanding um, where people are when they start their day. It's not the exact same thing as being there um, in person, but these morning meetings, if you were to watch them, if you were to come on a Zoom, as, as Sal said, and watch what's going on, you'd be impressed with how um, capable our teachers are and our kids are to have a morning meeting and check in with each other um, on Zoom. The second thing, and I can't emphasize this enough, I think one of the biggest breakthroughs from the last um, a couple months is just our ability to engage with families in ways that I actually think are superior to what we we're doing before. This is a tragedy of epic proportions. Um, we heard Randy say earlier, you know, 200,000 Americans have died. Um, our families are struggling financially in ways that, that are just, um, you know, so horrific. We had seven of our students this summer, five under the age of eight, murdered um, uh, by gun violence. This is a horrific, horrific situation. There are some things we're learning. And one of them is our families can engage with us using technology in a way that we haven't been when we were in bricks and mortar. Our families are able to talk to us about what's going on uh, at home. They're able to share with us what's going on with their child. We're able to connect with them one-on-one. -on -one. Um, we have Sunday night uh, gatherings across the country where our leaders are working with family leaders to say, what worked last week? What are we gonna do different next week? This is an unbelievably fluid situation. We've got anxiety, we have fear. People are wondering, you know, is it safe to do this? Is, am I okay doing this? We will get family feedback today about how we're meeting the moment um, almost instantaneously. And we've never done that. Um, we've never done that before. So it's one wow. of the big upsides and we won't be going back there. And so when you think about the social emotional learning, you think about the needs of students, um, we're able to in some ways get more information than we would typically. Think about in the, in the normal way we've operated, at least we have at KIPP, we have family nights, um, we have open house nights, we have back to school nights, we have teacher, you know, parent teacher conferences. Those are a few times a year for parent-teacher conferences. People might have to travel, you know, half an hour, an hour to get there. 
sit and, and wait in a line for 20 minutes. Um, we're able to have parent-teacher engagement now all the time. And with the learning platforms and Sol's, you know, Khan Academy's uh, one of these great learning platforms, our family's understanding of what their child is learning and not is actually going to be far higher now um, than it would be in, in our old ways of, uh, of working. So there are some real upsides. And I think in the social emotional, our contact level with parents um, is actually going to be far higher. And that's a good, that's a good thing. So there are new opportunities that may be actually working well for some students and families. That's an incredibly positive thing to hear. Sal, would you agree with that? Yeah, I, I think you know the, the irony that we're dealing with right now is that distance learning is for a lot of kids their main lifeline to a community, to friendships, to socialization outside of their direct family. And Randy Weingarten mentioned this is that you know so now if a teacher is running a, a distance learning session on video conference on say math or social studies, it's not just math or social studies that needs to happen. We need to make sure that there's space for kids to socialize with each other, get to know each other. Randy suggested you know starting with icebreaker things. We've launched a little effort called refresh.conacademy.org. They have these little exercises that teachers can do every 20, 30 minutes uh, that not only kind of ease the monotony maybe of distance learning, but also give them a chance to kind of be their whole selves, you know, draw an elephant with your eyes closed and share it with your friends, something to laugh about. We've also talked a lot about, and we've seen teachers do this, is really pull kids out of the screen, make sure they're cold calling them, make sure they're asking for their input, that it's a two-way conversation where possible, put them into virtual breakout sessions, drive that interaction. So not all of that interaction has to be uh, academic either. Uh, on our side, you know, Khan Academy supports kids learning at their own time and pace, gives teachers feedback. I have another project that I've just started launching. It's a not-for-profit effort separate from Khan Academy called schoolhouse.world, uh, which is to connect students who need live tutoring uh, with a vetted tutors who can run those group tutoring sessions. So we're also trying to be able to supplement what schools can do with more avenues for a live interaction community focused on learning in a safe environment. You see a need there. There's also still a lot of criticism. Uh, you may have heard in the previous session, uh, Randy Weingarten was, uh, he talked about some criticisms of the online resources. I want to give you an opportunity to respond to that, Sal. Yeah, well, you know, I actually agree very strongly with what uh, Randy mentioned. I, I don't think all online is equivalent. Uh, I think it matters much more of what is the goal of what you're trying to do, and then how does it work in symbiosis with what are happening at school. So Khan Academy has never billed itself as, you know, kind of a virtual school. Uh, and, uh, you know, we've always viewed ourselves, can we work in conjunction with teachers? Do we have the efficacy studies that show that we're accelerating student outcomes? I think some of the entities, and not all of them, but some of the entities that uh, Randy was referring to uh, have been in the for-profit space. They've been kind of selling some form of you know distance learning to schools for, for many, many years. And uh, the experiences with those things really aren't uh, that compelling. Most of what I've seen, the school districts who've had to, and the charter schools like KIPP that have had to really figure it out over the last few months are already doing a much better job at distance learning than a lot of these uh, kind of traditional for-profit providers. If you both had to look uh, to just one sign of progress over the, the next months that things are getting better, what would that be? I'll start with Richard, just quickly. So I'm going to say two things. One, I do think we're going to see um, students coming back gradually, and I think we're going to see increased comfort on the part of teachers, students, and families with, with returning to normal. It, it, it will be phased, but I think confidence will build. Um, second thing, can't emphasize enough, I think we are giving our teachers more and families more insight into what students are actually grasping, learning, comprehending, mastering than we were um, back in the day. And I think we're going to bring that back into bricks and mortar. Students are doing work on their own. And then when they come back to us for our synchronous learning, for our live learning with them, our teachers have more insight into what the student understands and doesn't um, than, they, than they used to have. And I think that's a really opt reason to be optimistic for the future. That is. Sal, any uh, final words on that thought? Signs of progress? Yeah, well, I, I, I think Richard mentioned a lot of it, that there's opportunities as we get back to school. This is going to be a tough year. We're going to have, you know, even more divergence in kids' um, preparedness. So I think once we go back to in-person, there's going to be a lot of work to get a lot of kids up to speed to make sure they can fill in their gaps uh, so they can they can re-engage. But there's a lot of good that might happen. Uh, I think a lot of systems, you know, Richard mentioned, are seeing that there's some places where we, we could put more um, – 
responsibility on the part of students, and that could make the whole system a little bit more flexible. You know, right now we're seeing school districts that are realizing, wait, in a distance learning world, you don't have to have one teacher for every 30 kids. Maybe one teacher who's really planned that unit and can really know how to facilitate it, they can do something for the whole district or for the whole system, and then other teachers can support in other places, and then for the next unit could be another teacher. So I, I think as we go into normalization, hopefully at the back half of this year and for sure for back to school next year, um, I'm hoping that systems as a whole start looking looking at, wow, we, we have some more options, we have more tools, we have a whole generation of teachers and parents that have been thrown into the deep end and students uh, with technology and they'll be a little bit more comfortable. Hopefully a lot of the digital divide uh, has been addressed uh, a lot better uh, by this time next year. And so I think that's gonna open up a lot of opportunities for learning not being bound by time or space or being able to personalize for individual needs better or um, you know be creative about leveraging the skill set of an entire district relative rather than just focus on what's in, in, in one school. Sal, Richard, great conversation. Thank you so much for joining us. Many, many thanks. And now another word from Nestle Waters, North America. I grew up in poverty and meals weren't always easy to come by. As kids start the new school year, millions will be struggling to get the food they need to learn. If your family is in need, Nestle Pure Life and No Kid Hungry are here to help. Hi, everyone. Um, this is Rima from Chalkbeat New York, um, and I just want to apologize for some previous technical difficulties. Um, uh, I am a reporter for Chalkbeat, and I cover New York City schools, and uh, today we have Commissioner Betty Rosa with us. Welcome, Commissioner Rosa. How are you today? Good, good. Thank you for doing this. Of course. Thank you. Um, let's get right into it. So um, this school year has just started in New York. Uh, we know that many districts will still be relying on a lot of virtual schooling. Um, in the spring, remote learning, as you've talked about before, deepened existing divides among students who didn't have tech access, who were learning English as a new language, or maybe students with disabilities. And um, a lot of attention has been paid to the logistics of reopening, but we haven't seen a lot about how we can improve remote instruction. So I'm really curious to hear, what are some of the lessons that you learned in the spring about how remote instruction can be improved, and how will you, um, in your position as interim commissioner, ensure that districts across the state are providing children with quality remote instruction, especially in the event that cases rise again here and school has to go back to an all remote setting? Sure. I think um, we were very fortunate during, as, as you know, we had our task force and we were able to capture in July um, and engage in many conversations with various stakeholders um, and also uh, parents, uh, teachers, principals, superintendents, to really take stock and look at lessons learned and also look uh, at the issue of, obviously, the, the issue of, of equity from both the digital and equity from various um, types of situations that really, uh, in many ways, impact on teaching and learning. So one of the one of the lessons that we learned was that uh, as we were getting ready to write our rethink grant, was that professional development needed to be a core. And so we were very blessed uh, to receive twenty million dollars to focus on professional development and um, with an emphasis on the remote and expanding uh, this platform to support the extended um, teaching and learning that we have to engage in during, not only because of remote, but because we know that learning is going to have to um, go beyond what we traditionally have looked at in terms of learning opportunities. Okay, let's turn to a big question on the minds of and educators, which is the safety of going back. Um, as you know, you know, New York, New York City particularly had an extremely traumatic spring 
being the epicenter of the coronavirus. Um, and we're seeing, you know, a steady increase in the number of families, at least here in New York City, choosing an all remote schedule for the fall, coupled with lots of frustration about changes and delays just in the reopening plan here. Um, schools across the state are required to follow a lots of guidelines to stop the spread inside buildings. But um, families, you know, are worried about hiccups. What if ventilation systems are not adequate? Or what if the youngest kids, uh, you know, can't keep their masks on all day? So I wanted to hear just what would you say to educators and families who are nervous about returning to school buildings? And, um, you know, would you be comfortable sending your own child back to a New York City school? Uh, great Great, great question. Uh, questions. Uh, first and foremost, we we spent a great deal of time during the summer really preparing, and as I mentioned uh, in, in the previous question about the task force, uh, as a result of that, we came out with a document, 150-page guidance, uh, that really intersected uh, with the our, our DOH um, and our work, uh, work around health and safety, trauma, isolation, but also issues of instruction. And from that guidance, every single district 100% developed their plans. Uh, we had all kinds of conversations to that were localized to ensure that families had opportunities to engage uh, with their superintendents, their principals, their parent associations, and others to really begin the local conversations and making sure that they felt their own schools and their own communities were prepared, uh, prepared from everything from health and safety to prepared in terms of uh, teachers available, if they were going to go into a hybrid model, what that would look like. So I think a lot of uh, New York State did a lot of work around not only the issue of responsiveness, but also preparing the, the kinds of conditions. And I have to give a shout out to a lot of the superintendents um, that have worked closely with the Department of Health to ensure that parents feel the sense of safety uh, around these issues, as well as teachers and other individuals that are responsible uh, for the education of our students. Uh, it, to respond, I, I recently did a visit uh, to look at a school right here in Albany, uh, Troy, that was um, obviously engaged in a hybrid model. And I was quite impressed, uh, not only by the pre-work that they did over the summer, but uh, the implementation uh, two weeks ago when I visited the high school and the middle school. Yes, I would send my child uh, knowing that the kind of work uh, that I've seen in many of our districts um, in preparation for, for this um, responsiveness to health and safety and instruction. Uh, and I would do it knowing that all this pre-work and all this work has gone into making sure that my child uh, would be in a setting, in a space that not only they would get uh, their education, but that, um, that the entire school would have met the conditions, what I call the inventory of knowing that they, uh, they have prepared to receive my child or any other child um, in the state. Okay, um, so just switching around topics here again, uh, let's let's talk about money. Um, we know that you know one big thing on the minds of superintendents across the city, um, as well as the chancellor of New York City, uh, is budget cuts, and which have been fueled by the economic fallout just of this pandemic over the past six months without extra money from the federal government or other revenue, um, such as by raising taxes, the governor has said that he could cut 20% of funding for school districts. And we know that that could heavily hurt districts that depend a lot more on state money and have high shares of low-income families, um, creating potentially deeper inequities than what we already see. So um, knowing that schools need to do so much more this year, how can they, in the light of such a grim financial situation and what what is your department doing to support districts with this issue? Well, I think Rima, you know that the Board of Regents and the department um, sent 
um, a, a letter to the feds uh, to pretty much outline our concerns and to make sure that uh, we created advocacy uh, with others around the need for the federal funding in terms of the uh, second phase. In addition to that, we've been working closely with uh, the the, uh, um, the governor's office in making sure that the issue of funding for our schools is an issue that is top priority. And uh, you may know by now that the, while the governor's um, situation in the state in general are quite challenging fiscally, uh, that in fact the responsiveness about making sure that our schools uh, for September, that the 20% original reductions uh, are not uh, going to happen for September. I think we need, obviously, to plan. I think we need to know what the commitment looks like from the feds in order to plan accordingly. This is this is a cha these are challenging times. We we want to make sure that the investments um, that the feds that Washington is truly making a commitment and saying that we need to do okay. we need to do more, but we need to do it with an investment. Okay, um, Commissioner Rosa, I think that's actually all the time we have today. Um, again, so sorry about my technical difficulties, but thanks so much for taking the time to uh, sit down with all of us today. Thank you for all the work you do, Rima. Thank you. Thank you. And that does it for this hour. Thanks again to Nestle Waters North America for supporting the Atlantic Festival, and thank you for watching. We want you to know that our programming continues later this evening on our Ideas stage. Beginning at 7 p.m. Eastern, we'll feature interviews with Hillary Clinton and CEO of Airbnb Brian Chesky, and much more. See you there.